We're going to start with kind of a mystery, uh, two, two, three mysteries maybe. And uh, what I'd like to do today, and what we're going to cover in here today, is talking about uh, who psychologists are. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the, a, a very brief history of psychology. And then, by the end uh, of the session today, I want to I wanna be able to spend some time talking about how you do psychology, the, the method behind it. And I, it, it sounds like maybe for some the most boring part, but in actuality, it's kind of a very cool, interesting part because we get to uncover some mysteries when we look at the method of psychology and how we do this discipline uh, using an empirical approach. And so, let me start with, um, some research and then I'll see where you stand on this and then I'll tell you the outcome of some of the research you can see where you're at and then I'd like you to help me explain it and that's kind of part of the mystery so raise your hands here if as a child um, you let's start with you uh, took a lot of chewable vitamins as a kid how many let me see your hands if you if you uh, did chewable vitamins as a kid uh, it looks like about uh, most 90%. How many did not do chewable vitamins as a kid? You knew that. You just, um, uh-huh, maybe, I don't know, 15, 20% of you all. Okay. Um, there's some interesting studies, and let me, I'll, I'll tell you what the statistics are on chewable vitamins in just a second, because um, at the end of the day, what happens is people who uh, took chewable vitamins as kids um, or actually at twice the risk of using marijuana and cocaine as uh, a young adults. Uh, you, you, in essence, have doubled your risk of uh, using cocaine and marijuana as uh, old adults. So, and by the way, a very good well study. Uh, we're gonna talk about the study itself. So let me see again if you did chewable vitamins so everybody else can see who you are. All right, good, all right. Now let me, okay, here's another one. How many, if you had to, you could only pick one of these. As a kid, you might have eaten oatmeal and you might have eaten Frosted Flakes, but let me just say, if you had to select and only say, I, if you gave me a chance or what I, the majority of the time I would eat this versus that, okay? Some of you say 50-50, then don't, then don't play along. But if you went, oh no, it, it, most likely I ate Frosted Flakes more than oatmeal. So let me see, if you ate Frosted Flakes more than oatmeal, uh-huh, wow. And then if you ate oatmeal more than Frosted Flakes. Well, the, the other half of the room, we got a 50-50. All right, that's awesome. Well, some cool psychological research, true, good data has shown this, ready? If um, you had oatmeal as a kid, primarily, versus Frosted Flakes, you're at four times greater risk of having cancer <laughs> Right now, you have four times greater risk of having cancer. And by the way, if you had Frosted Flakes, let me see you guys, you have half the cancer rates because you ate Frosted Flakes. That's awesome. So right now we have people with Frosted Flakes having half the cancer rates. Some people ate oatmeal, so you have you're at a higher risk of not only cancer, but um, if you, how many did oatmeal and chewable vitamins and you thought you were doing a good thing? <laughs> uh -huh. So you're going to actually maybe die of cancer as a drug addict. <laughs> I, got, I got one more. And, um, and, it, it, and it's also kind of, but by the way, there's good, this, is, this isn't bad research. In fact, it's very good research. It allows me, if you tell me, oh yeah, I had oatmeal and I took chewable vitamins, I could predict some things about your life. And, and that's, what, that's what good research does. It allows me to make some predictions. And so a lot of these studies have been done this way. There's another one, um, and this one it kind of works a little bit. It, it's not as uh, common uh, for some of y'all, and, and you'll see kind of what I mean here, but um, ultimately when we look at um, uh, uh, like, for example, certain movie choices. Let, let me give you an example. Um, if you, like list one um, versus list two, if I forced you to pick, now, now let, me, let me qualify this. Ready? As a kid, as a kid growing up, when you were, I'm gonna pick a couple of ages, ready? Seven, eight, nine, 10. During that time, if you were more likely to watch one list versus the other, seven, eight, nine, or 10, if you were more likely to watch one list versus the other, ready? 
How many would say you kind of fall, when you were seven, eight, nine, or 10, you were probably going to be in list one category? Dear old. And how many would say you're in list two category? Aha. Uh -huh. Awesome. Well, here's, a, here's an interesting kind of, ultimately what we find study-wise, by the way. Um, List one people um, and, and, and ha have some other problems. <laughs> list, one prob list one people um, are uh, usually um, struggling with things uh, in, in another way. Ready? They not only tend to use the harder drugs at a higher rate, <laughs> Uh, than list two people. We've now elevated, and by, I mean harder drugs, they are way more involved in drug usage than people actually that were in uh, list two. They also, ready, they also tend to have a greater likelihood of having sex outside of marriage. All right, ready? Uh, there's a good answer to every one of these things, um, and I think some of you are starting to figure out, if you hear data like this, you had better know the answer, because at the end of this class today, you should be able to go, makes sense, makes sense, makes sense, I understand, and here's why. You should be able, by the end of this class, to explain what I just gave you and explain the relationships between those two variables. Anybody want to try and give a shot at one of them? This is the first time you've heard it, maybe. If you've heard it before, yeah, but if you want to give it a shot, is it John, is that right? All right, John, go ahead. What do you think about John's view on that? Yeah. John, you're wrong. <laughs> John, you're, you're, you're very close to the answer. So do you, so let's take that one step further. Are there implicit hidden messages inside people who, the, the list one? How many have ever heard of, by the way, we're gonna talk in here about subliminal messages. Do you, are there any subliminal messages in list one? Oh, really? Could it, could, would someone, would you wanna, well, I'll tell you what. Before we go there, John is on the, on the right track. I want you to explain why. Anybody else have uh, any of the other variables that we talked about? Yeah, go ahead. Well, list one, all those stories are about them rebelling. Uh, so there's uh, something within the stories about them rebelling. There's some rebelliousness. Yeah, no. Yeah, yeah. So maybe there's, it, it kind of relates to what John was saying, right? A little bit of values implicit. Okay, I want you to think about, tell me about the vitamin use. Why are some children some of you all that took chewable vitamins, let me see your hand, well, no, don't raise your hand. You took chewable vitamins, why are you, Daisy, is that right? Oh. <laughs> Daisy, go ahead. It might have something to do with the fact that from a young age, you're just used to taking other substances. Oh, uh -huh. so as a young age, you get used to taking like Fred Flintstone or Barney Rubble or, uh, who are some of them, SpongeBob had some? How many had Barney the Dinosaur chewable vitamins? Did anybody? Well, give me some of the names of some of the chewable vitamins you had. <laughs> Flintstones, okay. So most of you took Flintstones. So what Daisy said is, is it true that now as a little kid, you kind of got used to doing that. Mom would say, come here, little four-year-old, take this, you know, and you're like, oh, I feel better. And now you go, now you go like this, I want more when I'm nine. It has to be harder, like baby aspirin. <laughs> And then at 12, it's like Tylenol. Do you think that's possible? You get used to taking something that makes you feel better, and so you keep taking it, and by the time you're 18, you were like struggling with things. Is that true? Possible? Listen, you'll know the answer by the end of today as to how to explain this like that. You're going to be sitting in a place where I was a couple of years, a long time ago, and uh, when I was up there, my, uh, we were pregnant. My wife was pregnant, but I was with her. Okay, so I'm with her, and we're in this hospital place, and they're saying things like this, and the lady gets up, and she goes, did you know? Okay, you had to go through this class, and you had to have the, the pregnant person there, and then the person that probably made them pregnant, I guess, but... 
<laughs> Usually that was the case, but it didn't have to be. You had to have somebody there, and we were all sitting there, and the nurse would get up in this, and in order to have a baby in this hospital, you had to go through this class. And so I'm sitting in the class with my wife, like, oh, dear Lord, get me out of this thing. But I sat there, I listened, and the person stood up, and she said, how many of you are planning to breastfeed? And you raise your hand. How many are planning to battlefeed? She goes, well, I'll tell you what, I, I'm, not, I, I'm a little bit biased here because I want to tell you some research, and sh it has shown that children... And we can ask you this. Let me see. Who, who knows if you've been breastfed or bottle fed? Let, let's try this. How many know that you were uh, breastfed mostly as a kid? Uh, how many know you were bottle fed as a kid? And how many like, I have no idea. I just, I was a kid and I don't, <laughs> it came in, I drank, I, I left and whatever. <laughs> By the way, if you, if you are in the category of, um, of breastfeeding uh, versus bottle feeding, kids with breastfeeding have higher IQs than kids that were bottle fed. <laughs> So there's some redeeming things for you all. And so I'm, at this, I'm in this, this hospital setting and this n n person up there doing the lecturing and talking said, oh, by the way, I don't want to be biased at all, but, ready? If you breastfeed your kid, research has shown they have higher IQs than kids that are bottle fed. And I sat there next to my wife, I go, ooh, and she kind of knows the nonverbal signs for me. That means, Chris, please don't do anything. <laughs> what are you doing? And I go, at least she can't say that, man. She's never had intro to psychology. <laughs> Why would she make that statement? And she's like, Chris, wait. I go, <gasps> I go, okay, Lisa, I'll wait till the break. So I went, waited for the break. I went up. I said, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I don't mean to be, you know, that guy. But you just said that you told all these people out there that if they had children and they breastfed them, they'd have higher IQs. How do you think the bottle people feel, you know, the, the, the moms feel about that? By the way, you said that if kids are breastfed, it gives them, they, we find that they have higher IQ, so we ought to breastfeed our children, not bottle feed. I said, you can't say that. And she's like, and I told her why, and to her credit, she went, oh, yeah, I got, I'll make that clearer. What did I tell her? I told her, you must have been bottle fed as a kid because that was <laughs> wrong. <laughs> What did I tell her? You're gonna know what to tell her at the end of this class. Well, somebody says, oh yeah, you took tuba vitamins as a kid, that means you are, you're like twice the risk of using marijuana and cocaine, and you're gonna go, oh wow, well, that's great. And here's the answer to why. And do you have a question? No, go ahead, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, correlation does not imply cognition. Oh golly, there is something deep about studies that like this that give us some really, really good information about people. <laughs> that information can allow me, you give me a room full of 500 people like this room and we put half of you on, random people, let's go out into the world, give, give me 500 people and let's bring them in here, all ages, shapes, sizes, just bring in a random uh, sample of 500 people and you, on this side of the room, you put people who are breastfed as children and put on this side of the room people who are bottle fed or, let's, or people who took chewable vitamins or people who didn't or people who watched list one versus list two of the movies, I can make some predictions about each of these categories and tell you more likely you will find on list two people over here we're going to have fewer drug <coughs> users who are having sex outside of marriage. I can predict that. They're gonna be sitting here. If, I, if you gave me the oatmeal group versus the Frosted Flake group, I know the Frosted Flake group, if I took all of their cancer rates, they're gonna have less cancer than the people with the oatmeal. Do you see why? Are you starting to figure out why? Are you saying, just tell us why? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can't yet. <laughs> because here's what I will do though. You have to know something about psychology and who psychologists are. And you have to know something about the history of psychology. And then at the very end, by the time we get to the end of today, you're gonna have to know something about the science. And it's a very quick, simple, I think, answer. Like I told the lady, and like she got up by the way and announced it at this thing, meeting, uh, whatever, class on pregnancy and delivery and whatever, and, and did a great job of explaining it. So, who are psychologists? Well, give me, in, in the popular media or press, give me, raise, raise your hand if you know somebody that's a psychologist or that maybe is out there that you know of, yeah. Go ahead. 
Oh, just, oh, you know, so give me a specific name of somebody out there in the popular media or press that is a psychologist that you know of or heard of. Dr. Phil. I mean, no, Dr. Phil as like the guy. Okay, give me another one that you know of or think of when you think of a, who? Dr. Daniel Amen. Oh, Dr. Daniel. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Doc, Daniel, I don't know if a lot of people know who that is. <laughs> give me a, one that everybody, give me another one. A psychologist out there that you think of when I th tell you. Dr. Laura. Dr. Laura. Ooh, good one. Dr. Phil, Dr. Laura. Anybody else? Come on. Okay. Tell you what, not, maybe, not, maybe not out in the media today, but who's a popular, well known name psychologist? Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud. Dr. Grace. Dr. Grace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's not going to work at all. <laughs> not at all. Uh huh, yeah. Abraham Maslow. Oh, Abraham Maslow, good one. Pavlov. And Ivan Pavlov. We got Sigmund Freud. We got, nobody said B.F. Skinner. I thought they'd say Skinner. That's Ivan Pavlov. So we got three, two out of the three. Uh, we got Dr. Phil, Dr. Laura. Oh, that's Dr. Dobson. Oh. <coughs> kind of, some of you knew that. Oh, well, nobody mentioned the Veggie Tail guy. <laughs> What's up with that? I mean, he's the guy that loves his lips, or he's helping the guy that loves his lips. How many know that one? See? All right. Well, you got to be thinking about these things. So, who are they? Ready? Um, I'm going to keep this really short. Psychologists, in general, are those that have a master's and a PhD. Um, if you want, uh, it's simple to, to think of that as somebody who's done a dissertation or doctoral level work, whether it's a PhD or even a PsyD. A PsyD is a little bit more professionally oriented. They don't have to necessarily do a dissertation. They, they might do a doctoral paper, but um, this, is, this is who can be called a psychologist. You can't just call yourself a psychologist because you, you, you're interested in humans and you, you know, whatever. You do have to get a PhD or a PsyD to be called a psychologist. It took me about, I don't know, it took me almost five years after I got my undergraduate degree, uh, about two and a half to get the master's and about two and a half to get the PhD. Here at Rosemead, for example, at Biola University, we, give, we offer a, both a PhD and a PsyD in psychology. And um, um, so, uh, but it's in clinical psych and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so that's the education and training. Now, by the way, um, there are other people who are in the, involved in the field of psychology who don't necessarily have a PhD. Um, to, in order to accomplish a PhD, for, for example, in clinical, you do have to do an internship. That's a year long. So that's another year usually that's added on if you're going to go into something called clinical or counseling psychology. How many know somebody that's in clinical or counseling psychology or has a degree in that? Great. They're probably a practicing psychologist. We'll talk some about what that means, but they, did, they certainly have done a, a, a year-long internship, and they can do that in a lot of places. We have a lot of, in Southern California, but almost anywhere you go, you'll find homes, you'll find clinics, you'll find hospitals, places where people do an internship, but the Bio Counseling Center would be a great example. Somebody could come here, do an internship here or in other places uh, at universities, for example. Psychiatrists, uh, how many know a psychiatrist? How are they different than a psychologist? Oh, they're, they're medical doctors and they can prescribe medicine. That's it, they got an MD, they didn't get a PhD, they got a medical doctor, they're a psychiatrist, and they can prescribe medication. I have also prescribed my own medication though. Most psychologists can't, I did. You guys wanna know how? Maybe you don't really care, but I'll tell you the story anyway. One time I go to this doctor and um, I see him and I have, I have a messed up back. I was playing baseball one time and really got my herniated some discs in my lower back. A bit, it kept bugging me. One time I went to this doctor and he goes, oh, okay, try this out, it'll help you. And it was like a Friday or a Thursday, I forget. I took it, he, he said, see if that'll help the pain a little bit. And um, I called him Friday, like, I don't know, five o'clock. And I said, I said to him, I said, hey, uh, yeah, this is, you know, I told him my name and I said, you gave me this prescription to see if it worked or if it hurt my stomach or anything. It worked great. <laughs> And I'd like to go ahead and have that as, you know, my prescription. And he goes, okay. Um, he goes, well, I'm getting ready to leave. How about, are you near a fax machine? I went, yeah, sure. So he goes, I'll just fax you the prescription. I went, oh, that'd be great. That way I have something this weekend. So he faxed it. I, I got the fax. Uh, I took it over to like one of the drug stores and I, and, uh, I handed it to the lady and she goes, oh, we can't take a fax prescription. I went, oh, why? He, he said on the phone you could. She goes, well, that, we can't take a fax. 
Uh, and so I was like, well, what, uh, okay, is there anything I can do? She goes, no, put your name on this and your phone number. I'll call you in the morning, I'll call the doctor in the morning and we'll, we'll get you set up. I'm like, all right, fine, whatever. Um, so um, it was like about, I don't know, 8.30 in the morning and I get this phone call and it goes like this. And it says, uh, yeah, I'm calling about the prescription for whatever it was uh, for uh, Chris Grace. And I said, uh-huh. And it's for, um, let's say it was Vicodin, blah, 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 at this amount. And I went, uh-huh. And you're a doctor, right? I went, uh-huh. <laughs> I am. And then I, uh, she goes, okay, thanks. I hung up. I thought, why would she care if I'm a doctor or not? I'm just getting a prescription. And then I went, oh, I wrote my number on the fact She thinks I'm the doctor. So she calls back a few minutes later. Yeah, hi, this is the pharmacy, um, uh, your prescription. And I went, oh, okay, yeah, sure, I'm ready. <laughs> You're a doctor, right? That's You're a doctor. What did that mean? So if you ever need anything, uh, uh, let me know. Because uh, <laughs> apparently I, I, can, I can do my own prescriptions. So only psychiatrists, can, they, they get an MD from medical school. It's different, of course. And uh, there are some people, by the way, who do master's level work. They just do two years of grad school plus some training. Anybody know some people that have, have gone to two year master's programs and, and got a degree and then maybe go out and practice? You know somebody? Anybody know what, some, what, what they might, like give me some examples of areas they might be practicing in or what they might be called. It, Anybody see somebody who is an MFCC? How many have heard of that before? Marriage, family, and child counselor, or a master's in social work is kind of, they're, they're just different ways, marriage and family therapy, or um, some of those individuals would still be kind of in the fold of psychology, uh, but practicing maybe at a master's level. All right, any questions? Um, when it comes to education and training then, I, I, just to kind of give you a sense that this is, um, uh, we'll, we'll talk some about the field and I told you a little bit about how a, a lot of times we end up studying scientifically or clinically or we approach it as a professional area. But let me just show you then uh, the employment. It, that is, if people end up with a degree like this, they tend to fall or do three kinds of work. And this is just a real quick, you could just write down the one, the two, and the three. You don't have to worry necessarily about what's underneath it. But you're going to find people who tend to either practice, we call those professionals. Those are the, pe the people that you would go see if you're struggling with um, maybe anxiety or, or depression or some other maybe disorder that is troubling. And, and those are professionals. They come out and they're just prepared and ready. And we call them clinicians or counselors or maybe even school psychologists. Then you have another category, the academicians and the teachers, who, who are primarily involved in um, bringing the information as a psychologist to, 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 the, to, you know, to classes or to universities or whatever. Um, and they tend to be researchers as well. Um, and you, of course, you can have some who are all three. They're professionals. They, they also teach at a, at a university and, and they do research. And um, so some of the psychologists, for example, at this university will, will be all three. They're clinical psychologists who do a lot of research and they teach classes. I, I'm not a practitioner, I'm an academician and a researcher in my area of social psych. Um, and that, that, that's where my training has been. Okay, so does that kind of give you a broad, broad sense real quick of what psychology, who psychologists are? Any questions about that? It's pretty straightforward. Nothing too, too big there. And like I said, you don't have to know the things underneath the one, two, and the three, just kind of as some examples. All right, so um, some, uh, for Biola faculty, I just, you don't have to write these down. I just wanted to give you a sense that, that many of them are involved in research, and here's some of the things they study. At, th at this university, you might find at some, any time, a, a research process going on about assessment of children, uh, in particular, things like attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder or learning disabilities, um, uh, the relationship between ADD and, and maybe brain functioning, uh, adoption and fertility issues. So you could just see all of that, and, and I just took like a real quick snapshot of some of the faculty there. So uh, the reason I do this is to show you how much and what kinds of things you can study uh, if you go into this field, and uh, there's just a lot there. Like I said, you don't have to write these down. It's just some of their own research interests and um, things they've been working on. So, um, uh, any questions on who psychologists are, kind of the area of the field? Anything from last time, if you have a question about as we move on? Yeah, go ahead. How many what? Starting salary? 
Oh, annual salary of like a psychologist? Oh, that's a great question. Ready? Um, when I came to Viola, I got my PhD, and uh, for a professor with the PhD, they called me up and said, hey, would you like to, uh, you know, I, I applied, and they, asked, they offered me a position. You all, you all know what my starting annual salary was? Anyone want to take a guess? It was, it was $19,500. Oh, yeah, that wasn't a month. <laughs> that was the whole, the whole thing, and I went, wow, that's not a lot of money. <laughs> Yeah, but back in 1950, it was a lot of money, so it, I was fine. <laughs> it, luckily, it went up a little bit, and it's gone up every time. Right now, if, if you're going to go be a faculty member at a university, for example, your starting salary, uh, annual salary, is probably going to start somewhere in the 60s, maybe 70s, if you have a PhD. If you're going to go into clinical psychology, one of the professional areas, you can charge a lot more, um, and, and you, I, don't, they, I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't know what they make. Maybe. Uh, I don't know. You can start with 150 bucks an hour, and you do that math out, but they're probably upwards of you know 100,000 or so starting. Yeah, good question. So uh, the history of psychology is that a, anybody else? Did, did any? Yeah. All right. Real quickly then, as we try and work our way towards uh, answering some of these questions that we brought at the beginning. Briefly, read this in the textbook. There's some great information. I don't expect you to memorize all the names and all the dates and all the people in the field of psychology. Here's a, for my exams, the, the key for you is to, if I put it up on the PowerPoint slide and I talk about it, it's probably more important. Well, it is more important and read that stuff in the book. There's a lot of detail in there and I'm not going to have you memorize all of it but I'll highlight what I think are the key things and you should know that. Does that make sense? So briefly, let, let me just show you what I mean by that. The field of psychology, um, to set the context, it, 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 it kind of emerged um, in, in, what, in what we call this era, this, this culture of discovery era. And what that meant was, uh, during this period of time when psychology came about, there were huge numbers of, of insights and discoveries that were going on about, for example, human behavior, and the world, and everything else. In fact, they called it this kind of culture of discovery era. And anybody know the two disciplines from which psychology would call it the parent disciplines? It kind of came out of these two big areas and said, we're going to adopt this from this area and this from this area, and uh, kind of like bring them together for this field of psychology. Anybody know what maybe one of the parent areas is? Yeah, philosophy would be one of the big ones. And, and uh, philosophy, the philosophy at the time was a very robust uh, discipline. It had been around for thousand, almost a thousand years, it, it, if not longer. Uh, and so, but this idea of philosophy, the, the idea of thinking kind of like about thinking, if you want. Um, and primarily what philosophy contributed to psychology was this kind of idea that, well, we could explore this, we could know. We, we, they, they had kind of, well, we should be able to study humans. And there's a, a particular way, an attitude, an approach they went about. Give me another, what uh, might be another of the parent disciplines of psychology besides philosophy. What was the other big era out, big area out there or discipline? And, biology. Yeah, biology or medicine, and they, kind of contributed, if you want that discipline, to this, the idea of using a methodology, a systematic study. And so that was the method that we use in psychology was given to, let's say, the field by biology and medicine, and then um, philosophy provided the attitude. Um, so, so how we explore human thinking and behavior and that it is knowable and it's interesting and anybody know when we credit the first person and who it was with bringing these kind of two fields together and starting its own study? In fact, what he did is he, he studied humans by asking them how they responded or how they felt when they heard a noise or a sound or saw a color. He would ask them in a laboratory, okay, I'm gonna make a noise, ready? And he would play some sound, let's say it was on a, a, a musical instrument, and he would just sit there, I want you to describe for me what happens when you hear this. And then he would just say, describe your sensations, if it makes you sneeze, or if it, <laughs> if it does other things to you, 
And so he would start asking people and exploring using kind of this systematic approach to figure out what was going on in here. Anybody know who, who that was that did those early studies like that? And we credit and we say, that's the founder or father of psychology. Oh, that's a good one. It's not it. He, he, he did studies like that. Give me another one. What's up? Yeah, um, there were, and we don't credit him with being the founder. Good guess. Uh huh. William Wundt, right? The W sounds like a V. Well, away from the V back. That's exactly right. William Wundt. 1879. Way to go. 1879. Oh, that's what you were saying, wasn't it? I misheard you. You were right. You were just, you weren't pronouncing it the way I was thinking. So you were right. She also had it. Wilhelm Wundt, 1879, Leipzig, Germany, began asking people to experience certain sensations. And then he wanted to figure out and describe what we call in this lab, the, he, he wanted to find out what was the structure of, of their thoughts. So as you heard this key or this sound or whatever you wanted, would it um, register in a way that he could begin uh, asking questions and explain the structure of, your, of our thoughts, or, be, or better yet, the structure of our minds? So he's kind of known as the father of psychology and of structuralism, because he asked the question, what's the structure? By the way, the word structure is just what you think. It, it's, if you think about a mind, what's it, what's it composed of? What's its structure? So, if, if I ask you this question, that wall right there, what's the structure of that wall? Well, you would say it's composed of what? That wall's composed of bricks. So if we looked at the individual bricks and it started to explain it, if you built it over and over again, you looked at each brick, and when you hear this sound or you see this color or you think this thought, he's explaining each brick by brick by brick, and eventually he thought we can get the whole structure of the mind, right? Just like if I want to know the structure of one of those sentences up there on the PowerPoint, I, I could go and I could look at, let's say, what's the structure of, of this word? Uh, I mean, of this sentence. It's this sentence is composed of words, and this word is composed of letters. And these, if you want, if you, I guess you could say these letters are composed of like pixels if you want. But if you understood the pixel or the, or the particular letter, you could start to figure out the structure of a brain. Now, the problem was this was 1879. We had no idea of looking inside the brain. And it was left up to therefore what? I couldn't peer in on the brain. Today, by the way, we can peer in on somebody's brain and see something occurring and happening now with some of our things and see some cool structure things. Like there's a guy, ready, who has this kind of interesting uh, way of having this, his, he has a little quirk in his brain. And in this little quirk in his brain that, that as he has experienced this, um, we'll talk about this guy who experienced this particular stroke, what it did is it wiped out a part of his brain that he cannot identify human faces. There's a little structure in your brain that allows you to identify human faces. Well, Voon didn't know that because he couldn't see it, but we know where that structure is, and this guy's had a stroke and it wiped out that structure, so guess what happens to him if he's out in the middle of public? Let's say he goes and he's at a basketball or football game and he's with his family and he goes and gets something to drink, he comes back, he don't know, who, he don't know where his family is. He don't know who the, his family He could be standing right in front of them and he doesn't recognize their faces. That's weird, isn't it? In fact, you ask him and he'll say, I, I don't know, I can't, I don't know who they are. I don't see, I can't recognize the face. Not a weird thing, but if we start to put together these structures, which we can do now, you can start to see a little bit more. Back then, it didn't really work very well and it didn't last very long because we didn't have any of these abilities. And even today, it's rudimentary and we probably still couldn't do a structural approach to psychology. It would be bogged down in too many complex uh, uh, points and nuances. Yeah, question. Uh-huh, he could recognize his wife's voice, but even as he sits there and talks to her, the only reason he knows it's his wife is he just assumes, and he, when he looks over, he can't recognize her most of the time. He just simply goes, well, we're in the right place, we're in our house together, so I'm assuming that's her. <laughs> no, it's true, but we can start looking at these structures. I'm really digressing. 
uh, we, 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 that was structuralism. Wundt, he wanted to see structures. We, we can see them a little bit clearer today. By the way, here's uh, kind of a timeline. You don't have to know all these names. I'm just showing you people that were involved, like Stanley Hall and uh, you know, Herman Ebbinghaus and James. It was around the turn of it, the century, of the last century, 1880s. Another real quick thing, ready? William James um, ultimately uh, founded a school called functionalism um, at, at about the same time because when Wundt and his people were working at, on structuralism ideas about the brain and the mind in his, their labs in Leipzig, uh, James was going, wait, he was starting literally what became probably the area, it's called functionalism, that overtook structuralism. And James went like this, he said to, to people like Wundt and others, he goes, why would you, you'll never know the structure of a brain. To, for us to figure out the structure of that wall would require us to understand each and every brick and the brain is, and the mind is so amazingly complicated and now you're relying on people telling us what they experience. Why would you care about the structure? You ought to care about the what? Function. The function, what did, why do you have thoughts? Why can you recognize faces? Why is seeing a face a good thing? Well, we see faces because it functions to keep us safe, or it functions to make us happy, or we pick out, so the brain, why, do, why are we vigilant and aware, and why can we process things very quickly, something called unconscious cognition? Well, James would say it's because it has a function. What's the function of it? If you understand the function of identifying faces, then we know, oh, kids become attached or have memories associated with, or we can pick up faces and see who's gonna hurt us and who's not because we're really good at it. That's the function, it's called functionalism. So more people, um, John Watson we'll see in a little bit, Ivan Pavlov, some uh, researchers like Mary Calkins and Margaret Washburn, well-known psychologist of early, early on in the beginning of the field. And then lastly, just I want to give you the American, I guess, uh, John Watson, who's known, and, and this helps us to come up, what, what's, by the way, the definition of psychology? It's the scientific study of the mind and behavior. And the reason we call the definition of psychology the scientific study of the mind and behavior is we, the and behaviors because of John Watson. He founded a school of behaviorism and he said this, it doesn't matter what your mind structure is or function is, what's most important? Your, mind's, your, your behavior. Let's just watch their behavior. Humans will tell me all kinds of things if we, if we just simply stick to what they do and how they act and how they talk and how they say and what they are doing. We, don't, we can't see inside the little black box. So he founded this school called behaviorism. So put it all up there. Biola was founded this university right around the same time, 19 what? 1908. And then the Titanic sank right around that time, <laughs> if you wanted to know. And there's the only guy that smiled for his picture right there. Uh, it was really cool. Okay. So um, at the end of the day, when we look at psychology um, and when it was founded, it was around the time of era, uh, culture of discovery. It was also during a time uh, when you look at the relationship between Christianity and science, a lot of um, the Christians that were uh, kind of involved in the early scientific discovery eras were not contributing to this field of psychology around the turn of that century because it's at that time of kind of this isolationist period where Christians were kind of stepping out of the intellectual culture. Many of them were fi founding schools um, that were, let's say, more uh, biblical or Bible institutes and uh, because a lot of the, the, the universities had given up any hope whatsoever of being founded on, on Christian principles. And so a lot of uh, the Christian intellectuals just kind of stepped out of that culture. And that's kind of where, where psychology kind of started developing and coming in to its prominence was during this kind of interesting cultural era. You don't have to know that. It's just a kind of an interesting insight. Any questions on this? All right, that was just a really quick history. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.